I turned my microphone on without Michael having to tell me to do it. Yep. I deserve a prize for that. And this candle's in my way. There we go. All right. Genesis chapter 11, turn there. Hope you all had a good day today. Amen. Um, I know from at least one person, God changing my message this morning was a blessing. I appreciate that. And um, that happens sometimes. You got uh, some people write books about how to listen to God. I just like listen to God. There's a, um, and there's probably hundreds of people like this, but YouTube recommended a video I watch, and it's a young guy making, you know, video blogs, and he always names them things like, God said this to me, God told me this, God gave me a vision of that, and... He just spends 20, 30 minutes, whatever, rambling on about what he thinks God told him. He said that one night he just decided to just spend hours and hours and hours doing nothing but waiting for God to speak to him. And I'm going, you could have made this a lot quicker if you just opened your Bible up. Would have gone by a lot quicker... Open that Bible up, read it. That's God speaking. Now, if God wants to give you some meaning for that, I'm sure that he will at some point. Maybe right then, maybe it'll take days, I don't know. But it just amazes me, um, the, the Watchman broadcast that's coming out now, I've got it up being uploaded right now, is about specifically that. All of these people all over, Christian television, Christian radio, and the internet saying, God said this to me, and God says, no, I didn't. I didn't say that to them. And then the question then, how can I, Mike Hoggard, how can I say definitively that God did not say those words? They're not in here. If I want to know something that God said, I can read it in his book, his scriptures. Okay, I can read it in the scriptures. Think about the things that Jesus did. If you study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find that often that Practically everything that Jesus did somehow, some way fulfilled an Old Testament scripture that was written of him. And, and a lot of times it'll make note of it. And thus it was thus, you know, he said it because it fulfilled the scripture sayings, blah, 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 blah. The scriptures always are going to be fulfilled. Always. They're always going to be testified of, spoken of. Uh, proven to be right in everything that it says. They're going to be proven to be right. So if you're wanting, if you're waiting to hear from God, read your Bible while you're waiting. Amen. Now, um, you're in Genesis 11. Look back one verse, Genesis 10. And I'll explain a little bit about what's going on here and, and just sort of my idea. In fact, Genesis 10, let's pick it up in verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almadad and Sheleph and Hezar Maveth, and Jera, and Hadoram, and Uzal, 
and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimiel, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havila, and Jodab. All these are the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. And then it says in verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations, and here's the word, divided in the earth after the flood. Now, let's read um, the first verse of the next chapter. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Let's pray. Um, Pray for Sister Bonnie, who is recovering from COVID. Pray for Brother Sterling, who is recovering from the damage done to his lungs by COVID and for others. Pray for our church. Pray for the people of Kenya. Pray that God would continue to use this church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the thing that's really important. Okay. Do you have to have a million dollars in your bank account in order for you to continue living in life and be happy and to serve God? No, I don't. In fact, it probably wouldn't be good for me. Probably wouldn't be good. Okay? So let's pray that the message that God sends forth out of this place is the right message. Not so much worried about what happens now, but what happens in eternity. Amen? Father, we do ask your blessings on your word. We thank you, God, for bringing us together. We thank you, Father, for opening up our eyes to your word. I thank you for this young man's testimony tonight. Lord, that he shared how that, God, you used our church to show him the word of God. That this Bible is right in everything that it says. And Father, if this Bible's not right, where is it that we can turn to find the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? As Peter said, you have the words of eternal life. So Father, we thank you, God, for this book and for leading us to this book. Father, we ask, God, that you would open up the words of this book to our minds, our understanding uh, and Father, what we don't understand today, maybe a year from now, five years from now, God, you'll add something to it. Maybe six months from now, you'll add something to it that'll make sense. And it'll show us, Father, what's going on in our world and the shape that our world is in and why you do things the way you do. Show us what's right and show what's wrong. What's wrong. Show us the difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. And help us, dear God, to be sober-minded in everything that we do. To learn this book, to learn its doctrines, to learn the right way of salvation, to know the gospel, and to be able to share that with others. Bless your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> now, uh, the reason why I put those verses together very, very quickly, God apparently wanted everybody split up. So here's what he said he did. Number one, in Genesis 10, God is dividing everybody by the particular family that they were born from. You have the three sons of Noah, Shem. Shem is where we get the word Semite. And it's where the, the Israelites come from. They come from Shem. Ham, the father of the Hamites, Cush was one of those children of Ham, and, um, and then Japheth. It is known that there, I got a wasp on my arm. There he comes. Anyway, it is known that there are three primary races of men, Caucasoid, Negroid, Mongoloid. And so all three of those races descended from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Um, I'm not even going to get into who came from who, but that's where they originated from. So God divided them, number one, by outward appearance. Okay? Some who are this color, some who are that color, some whose eyes do this, some whose eyes do that. God divided them that way by their particular family, but then they all spoke the same language. Then we find out, Genesis 11, that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And we're going to find out later that God then confused all of those languages. So what would happen? The people who are speaking Sumerian, they gather together because they can understand one another. The people who are speaking Babylonian, they gather together, they can understand one another. People who are speaking Hebrew, they gather together because they can understand one another. And they're separating themselves by family and then by language. And it's, it, it amazes me in Kenya, um, every tribe, and I don't know how many tribes there are in Kenya. I know the Luos and the Turkanas and the Samburus. And believe it or not, each one of those tribes all have their own dialect, they have their own language. So if you grew up in Kenya, more than likely you will speak three languages. You will speak your tribal dialect. You will speak Swahili, which is a common dialect. And English. All three. Okay? Um... And for someone to be able to learn and speak three languages, those are not dumb people. It takes intelligence to do that. As far as that's concerned, very intelligent people. Okay? So anyway, even in the tribes in Africa, they have their own tribal dialect. So, uh, in fact, I got on the elevator with a guy one time in, um, where was I? Way out somewhere. And... I could hear him talking. He worked for the hotel that we were staying in and I could hear him talking. He had an accent and I said, where's your accent from? He said, I'm from Africa. And I said, yeah. I said, what nation? He said, Kenya. I said, oh, I said, well, my son-in-law is from Kenya. Um, he comes from the Omondi. No, no, what's your uncle's name? Omondi, right? He comes from the Omundi family. He said, oh, he's Luo. He knew that instantly. Oh, okay. So God divided them up by tribe, by family. And then by language. And then back in Genesis 10, uh, verse, where was I reading from? 25, unto Eber was born two sons, and name of one was Peleg, for in his day was the earth divided. So I believe at that time, North and South America attached to Africa and Europe. So I believe there was one, if you look in verse 1 of chapter 11, whole earth. I believe there was one landmass, and God divided it. God separated North South America from Europe and Africa. And then we know that a lot of the Malaysian islands or the Indonesian nations, some of those islands, they used to be connected together at one time. Now they're not connected together anymore. There's ocean covers them up and separates them out. Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, the same way. So what God did was he separated everybody across the face of the earth. Well, here's why he did that. And it's in Genesis chapter 11. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So everyone spoke the same language. Now, some people say that they, you know, the mother tongue was a lost language, doesn't exist anymore. I've read some things. I sort of believe that it was Hebrew, that Hebrew was the mother language, although I can't prove that. I don't know that 100% for sure. 
But the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Shinar, it's no longer called Shinar, it's called Sumeria. And it is in and around the area of Iran and Iraq. It is in that area there. Babylon would have been in Iraq somewhere. And the Tower of Babel would be in Iraq. So, verse 3. And they said one to another, the people, all together, they all say the same language, they all have the same speech. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. They had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. Slime was what? Does anybody know? It's what happens on Ghostbusters when the ghost touches you, slimes you. What was it, John? Tar, pitch. Okay, real thick pitch. After it's heated up, they would heat it up. And set their, their, their bricks down. And as the, the tar or the pitch cooled off, it hardened. That's what our driveway is made out of, asphalt. Once the asphalt's heated up or the, the tar is heated up, um, they mix it with the gravel, lay it out there, and once it cools, it's hardened. So they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. By the way, Freemasonry. The Secret Society of Freemasonry, in one uh, book that I read, uh, they have they point to several things in history as part of the origin of Freemasonry. And in one case, um, it wasn't Albert Pike, it was the other guy, Manley Hall. Manley Hall says that Masonry draws its inspiration for its existence, or they trace back they're beginning to the building of the Tower of Babel because who is it that lays bricks? Masons, okay? So that's where they get their story from. So they said, one to another, let go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach in unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, this is man's attempt at circumventing God's plan. And man now, that's in his nature. Because in Genesis 3, man lived in paradise. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. They had everything given to them for free. They had all the fruit of the Garden of Eden to eat freely. They had everything handed to them. They did not have to toil. They did not have to labor. They had a perfect world that they lived in. But they chose to disobey God and not keep His commandment. Therefore, they fell and God said, I'm going to curse childbirth. I'm going to curse uh, the ground that you sow your seed on. And I'm going to make you work and sweat for the things you eat rather than me just giving it to you. See, it was paradise, but paradise was lost. But then God made a promise. He, he said to the serpent, the seed of the woman, there's going to be enmity between you and the seed, between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And it's a sort of a prophecy of Jesus Christ. In other words, God had a remedy for man's fallen condition. And it was going to be the work of God. Turn to Revelation. All the way to the back of the book. Chapter 21. <clears throat> So, 
man's already in a fallen state. And he wants to ascend up. He wants to rise up above his condition here on this earth and live among the stars, live in the heavens. Revelation 21, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And if you keep reading, he says in verse 3, And I beheld a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So, God has his plan, Gary, of sending his holy city, New Jerusalem, down from heaven to be here on this new earth. God's going to remove all pain, all sorrow, all labor, all death, the sting of death. He's going to wipe all the tears from our eyes, going to wipe all the sweat from our brow. And it's going to be an absolute, perfect, utopian society forever as a gift from God to undeserving mankind. Amen? Man says, well, we don't want that. Because look at what they're doing. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. But God's already got a plan whereby he's going to send heaven and New Jerusalem down to earth to benefit mankind, not just for a little season, but for all of eternity. And you would think, well, that's a far better deal. But because of the wicked, depraved nature of mankind, man always chooses his way rather than God's way. And by the way, it's a dumb idea. What do we know about living on the moon? Because they're saying now we're going to have a colony on the moon. People are going to live up there. What, what do we know about living on the moon? How much grass grows on the moon? How many lakes up there are up on the moon? None. There's no air. There's no grass. No water. There's nothing up there. It is an impossible environment to live in. Okay? And I'll, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but Living up in the heavens is infinitely more hazardous than living down here. Amen? Now, you're looking at a guy. In my childhood, astronauts were it. I always I, I admired astronauts. I read every book I could get on astronauts and going to space and rocket travel and everything like that. I mean, I was a child of the 70s. I mean, that was me. That was my thing. I thought those astronauts were the greatest men that ever walked. Okay? And wanted to be them. But God has since convinced me that I have a better plan for my life than being an astronaut. Astronauts get killed. We lost the Columbia astronauts. We lost the Challenger astronauts. Apollo 1, we lost three astronauts, never even got off the ground. Supposedly, in the old Soviet Union, there was a cosmonaut that they sent up into space before Yuri Gagarin, but his mission failed, his oxygen ran out, and he died in space. But, of course, they didn't announce that. Okay? So, outer space is a horrible place 
to try to live. There are no resources, there are no natural resources. You can't find oxygen up there. Everything has to be taken off earth and put up there. But man's plan still to this day is this right here. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. In fact, let me show you this. That, of course, is a Saturn V rocket. It's a tower. It's a tower. And they say that the, the thing that they were building in Babylon was a ziggurat, which was a step pyramid. In other words, you would ascend to heaven in stages. Well, it just so happens the rocket they built to send men to the moon was in stages. The first stage got them up off the ground. They dropped that. The second stage put them up in orbit. They dropped that. The third stage got them, uh, they accelerated around the earth and slingshotted themselves at about 25,000 miles an hour to head to the moon. It took them three days to get there. Okay, so everything they did was in stages, just like Freemasonry or any secret society or any witch's coven. They say you can't just become a master wizard or a master witch or a high ranking Freemason the day you join. You can't do that. You have to go through the levels and the stages. Contrast that with salvation. The day you get saved, are you, is there somebody who is more saved than you are that you have to try to keep up with them? No. A person who gets saved and is only saved a day and they die goes to the same heaven that a person who's been saved for 40 years and they die. They go to the same heaven. Get the same reward. Amen. So it's not about levels. And, but that's man's, that's man's plan. Man's way of doing it. And all throughout history, man has always established civilizations that saw people as lower citizens or the upper class citizens. India still uses the caste system. And it's because 80% of people from India are Hindus and the Hindu religion teaches uh, reincarnation. And that if you did not do well in one life, when you're reincarnated, you are reincarnated to live in a lower caste because your previous life, you didn't do enough good deeds. And usually... It's based upon the color of their skin. The really dark skinned people of India, they live in poverty, they get very low paying jobs, and to this day, someone from a lower caste cannot marry somebody from an, a higher caste. Even though they're in love, they, they, their families won't let them do it. You can't marry him, he's from a lower caste. And it's because they believe in a previous life, he was a no good jerk. And he deserves to stay poor the rest of his life. Okay. I went, um, I've been to Mexico. There is a clear difference between the Spanish Mexican citizens and the native Indian Mexican citizens. You can tell by the color of their skin. The native Aztec people usually are very poor. Their children go to very poor schools and they just don't get good jobs. But the European Spanish Mexican citizens, those who descended from Spain because their skin is lighter, they get better jobs. Do you believe that exists around the world? Absolutely. In England, you're judged by your accent. You're judged by your accent. If you have a proper British accent, 
then you are of a higher class of people than somebody who might have a Irish accent or a Scottish accent or a Welsh accent or a Cockney accent. You're of a higher class of people. I met a man who was a British newspaper journalist, editor, Alan Franklin. His wife was from this area and he, he came and spoke at our church one time. I, re I really enjoyed him. Good, good Christian man. But he, he despised the classification system in his own country. He said, it still exists. And he said, the royal family, to me, it's a joke. Those people put their pants on the same way I do. Who said that they're any better than me? But that's how it's been since Babel. Men of higher stature, men who have achieved, who have climbed the ladder higher than others, attain more, get more, deserve more in their eyes than other people. And yet Jesus sees us all exactly the same. Somebody say amen. amen. By the way, we now have a city. Here's the tower. Here's the city. International Space Station. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Um, the movie Elysium. The word Elysium is based upon an old myth, an old religious idea that Elysium is a place in the heavens where all the people who do heroic deeds or good deeds can go and live. And they made a movie about this, that they put a space station up in above the earth. And if you were rich, successful, high-bred, high-browed, then you got to live up in the heavenly city, Elysium. And up in the heavenly city, Elysium, they had technology where nobody, if you got sick, you just laid down in this little body scanner and it would scan you, figure out what disease you had and heal you instantly so that people up in Elysium could live basically forever. While all the people down here on earth were struggling with poverty and the government was tyranny and they had suffered disease and they didn't have any health care and it on and on and on. And the whole idea of the movie was to bring heaven down to earth. Sound familiar? Now, that's a movie. Jeff Bezos, you know who that is? Guy that runs Amazon.com. He's Him and um, Elon Musk have all this money and they don't know what to do with it. So they both got into the space business. Elon Musk building the dragon. You understand that? The dragon that ascends up into heaven, but he has to fall back down. Okay. Jeff Bezos presented his plan and he said, instead of us trying to go to Mars to establish colonies on Mars, it would be a lot easier if we built these revolving cities that uh, orbited our own planet. It would be a lot easier to get to them. And we could build these floating cities up in the heavens, just like in the movie Elysium. We could plant things up there. We could create an environment up there. We basically could create a whole new world up there. Now, I have a theory about this. In Revelation um, turn to Revelation 18. No. Where am I wanting to turn to? Where's he? Oh, Revelation 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way 
and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So one of these days, God's going to pour out vials of his wrath on the earth. Well, Gary, what if you live on Mars? Will you escape that wrath? Possible. If you lived on the moon, or if you lived up in one of those floating cities up there, would you escape that? If you look in um, Revelation 6, people are trying to escape what they know is coming. Revelation 6, verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens, which are caves, and in the rocks of the mountains. Now they're hiding underground. So we got people trying to live up in heaven and people trying to live underground to escape those things that are coming. Is it going to work? No. Does it matter if they form colonies on Mars? They're not going to escape. And all of this, 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So again, God has already built a city for us higher than the heavens. And we're going to live there for eternity. And what did we do to deserve that? Nothing. All God asks us to do, give up our sin. Amen? Man, do, man doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to give up his sin. He wants to keep his sin and yet live in the heavens and escape the wrath of God. And it's the billionaires that are planning this. Building deep underground cities. China has them. Deep underground cities. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and others theorizing we could build things where man could live up above the earth and escape any catastrophe that would happen down here on this earth, we would escape that. Yeah, but they wouldn't escape any catastrophe that would happen in heaven. But that's the way man thinks. Let's don't do it God's way. Let's do it our way. And the religion of Freemasonry is that you attain heaven by the work of of your hands as a, as a mason. But look at 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Jerusalem above wasn't built by our labor. It was built by God and given to us as a free gift. Because we trusted God's word, we trusted in Jesus Christ. But man doesn't want to do that. So he wants to build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Turn to Amos chapter 9. To me, this, this fascinates me. God had foreseen... That man would get to a place where he would leave the bounds of earth, go up into the heavens, all in an attempt to escape God's wrath. And they thought it was impossible. And believe it or not, well, I know you believe it because it's on the internet. There are people this day who are convinced that nobody ever went up into space. That was all done in a Hollywood movie studio. And it was fake. 
But what did God say? Amos chapter 9 verse 1. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. And he said, smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the least of them with the sword and he that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Notice verse 2. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Though they climb into heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent and he shall bite them. In other words, is there any place that man can run to where he can escape the wrath of God? Tom DeLong, the guy who started the rock band Blink-182, uh, made a bunch of money, and he's another one of these guys, got a bunch of money, now I want to know what I can do with it. He formed a company called To The Stars Academy. And he's hired former Defense Department, former CIA, former NSA. He's hired these guys. And according to them, they have technology from extraterrestrial sources that they intend to use to build ships that will carry man off of this planet and send him out exploring the stars just like Star Trek. Dead, and these guys are dead serious. We're not talking about he went to a UFO meeting and found a bunch of guys that, hey, let's, let's build us our own spacecraft and let's go to Mars. No, he picked scientists who work for the Department of Defense and the CIA, and they work for Tom DeLong now in his To The Stars Academy. The name To The Stars Academy means we want to go to the stars. We want to live up there. And they're even talking about the ability to warp space so that man does have the ability to leave this planet and go live on another one. And they're dead serious about this. Very serious about it. So that's Amos 9. Now turn over to the next page, Obadiah. Two witnesses where God said man is going to attempt to fly into the heavens to escape. Obadiah, it's only one chapter, verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Verse 4, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And I want you to look up on the screen. The Apollo 11 patch was an eagle with a branch in his claw to build a nest among the stars. Now, I don't think that Neil, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins got to design their own patch. I don't think they read Obadiah and said, that's, what we'll, that's how we'll design it. I don't think they did that. But I think God foresaw the future. God knew that it was going to happen. So now we're living literally in a time. They're talking about the technology to get us out of this earth to live in space. 
and the ability to alter man's genetics so that he can survive living in space. Altering mankind, giving man a future, because it's like it's in the back of their mind that something bad is going to happen on this earth. And when it does, we want to be gone from here so it doesn't happen to us. But what does God say? If you get up there, I'm going to bring you back down, saith the Lord. There's an easier way. If you want to see Mars, there's an easier way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I'm going to get to see Mars one of these days. And Venus and Saturn. And all the stars of heaven, I'm going to get to see them one of these days without a spaceship. Amen? I'm going to get to live not in heaven, above heaven. The heaven of heavens, the Bible calls it. Is there a heaven above heavens? Yes, it's where God lives. We're going to be there one of these days. Amen? Amen? So, God had to put a stop to this. I, it's past five. But next week, God had to put a stop to this. And he did. And so next Sunday night, we're going to talk about confusion of tongues. Confusion of languages. I wish Wayne were here. Wayne was as good at faking tongues as anybody I've ever heard in my life. He did that one night and I went, that's good. So the question is, is it a blessing of God to speak a language that nobody knows what it means? Or is it a curse? And read Genesis 11. What did God do when he saw the imagination of man giving him ideas to build this city and this tower whose top may reach into heaven? What did God do? He cursed man. He didn't bless him. He cursed him. Okay? And even listening to somebody speak English who's from another country, that's hard too. That's hard. Let's stand to our feet. Cheeseburger and turkey leg for being so good. I'll give you a piece of candy. All right. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for this book. Lord, I wanted to be one of those guys fly through outer space, wanted to go to the moon, wanted to go to Mars. That was just me, God. That's, that was my boyhood. You know me. But Father, I'll wait. I'll wait for the day where I won't need a rocket ship, a spacesuit. I won't need any of that. I'll be able to fly through this, through the heavens, looking at the beauty of your creation, worshiping you for all of eternity because of Jesus Christ. You've made my dreams come true in a way far better than I could have ever done myself. Father, I love this book. I love what it says. I love 
the things, God, that you've put in it. Your word is there to prove to mankind that all of his efforts are in vain, that we should trust you. Father, help us to trust you this week. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, you ready?